Nadia. It's so lovely to be with you. And what's wonderful is this morning, well, it's morning where I am, it's afternoon where you are. I'm yes. speaking to global learning and development expert, Cindy Hancock. And isn't it marvelous? So you are in Johannesburg, South Africa, which is seven hours ahead. That's right. And uh, wonderful to coordinate ourselves so that we can have this beautiful space of meeting and discussing and having fun together. I know. And it's such a special time because March in the US, of course, is Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. So what an ideal opportunity to discuss the fact that, yes, right, Cindy, women have made strides. Absolutely. But still huge gaps. And organizations are still working hard on developing their women leaders. So mm. I know you've got some stats on the gaps that exist. And I let's do. talk about that. And then we're going to talk about how, if you are watching in an HR position, in an organization, you can help the women in your organization. Thank you so much, Nadia. So there was a report um, from Working Women um, that... Uh, did a bit of research and they discovered that women are educated. 66% of respondents have post-education, tertiary education. Uh, it also showed that women are very ambitious. 78% aspire to grow their careers across all age categories. So ageism doesn't come into play here. Um, jobs dissatisfaction is high, where 45% of women currently working are indicating that they look that they are looking for another job where there are more um space in the organizations for growth recognition reward etc but it also showed and i love this that women are financially driven um, the ambition for career growth and financial stability drives such a desire to work um, so with 80% having dependents and 37% being sole income earners, financial reward is essential. So these are just some key findings that um, I really thought was interesting. But the crux of the whole um, uh, report showed me that 78% of women aspire to grow in their careers. 98% of women want to work. And the extraordinary thing is that we understand this, and yet still across organizations, all the statistics show that top leadership is still mm -hmm. predominantly male-dominated. So mm -hmm. let's start off with Cindy and discuss the business case. Why is it so important that we empower women. And while I give you a moment to formulate your answer, I recently had a conversation with a potential client who wanted me to speak for International Women's Day, which is Friday. And the question that I was asked was, how do you get buy-in from the men in your organization? Why? Because it's important that they see the value as well. So, you know, really appreciate your thoughts on this. And I know you Thank teach you. your training. Around this. Yes, I do. And um, I must tell you that um, we we need to celebrate, first of all, the trailblazers, the women who have been there and, and gone before us and really um, paved the way for us. But we also need to acknowledge the men who have partnered up and um, have come around to um, really embracing women in the workplace um, where equal opportunities uh, exist. So we can ensure in organizations that women have an equal access to job opportunities, promotions, um, career development programs. And organizations can also implement policies that pro promote gender diversity and inclusion. Um, I think that is an important uh, starting point is to create those equal opportunities. Um, mentorship of course, is a fantastic um, way of upskilling uh, women. Uh, now, to establish mentorship or maybe a sponsorship type program where the senior leader can mentor and sponsor women employees, providing that guidance, that support, advocacy for their careers. So where we can really, and if it happens to be a male, where we can um, partner up, but what I've also found in my in my trainings um, on women's leadership is that women don't tend to self-promote. 
Um, they don't take calculated risks. Um, so there's a little bit more caution um, that gets given to women. So I'm interested to know your thoughts on, um, you know, these few things that I've just mentioned. Cindy, you know, it's interesting because I've spoken to numerous, numerous women's organizations across the world on networking to level mm. the playing field, networking to enhance DEI. And what you're saying is so true is that, and I'm not saying all men, all women, but women tend to be much more reticent to ask. That's right. So, um, you know, I wrote a book called Own Your Space with Laurie Milner, and one of the chapters is Own Your Ask. And you and I have spoken about that. So if you've just joined us, I'm talking to global learning and development specialist. She's also an e-learning specialist. She's done work for the United Nations. She is a remarkable learning partner, digital learning partner, and in-person learning partner, Sydney Hancock. And we're talking about Women's History Month. And tips, advice, guidance for women themselves, but also leaders in organizations to promote women. And one mm -hmm. of the things is the ask. And women tend to be happy to give, but they find it hard to ask. So this is the example I give, Cindy, and I'm curious your thoughts. So, you know, guys on the, the golf course, right? It's, hey, bud, I know you know so-and-so, it's so-and-so, can you give me an intro? And there's that mm -hmm. kind of banter that takes place. Mm -hmm. It's women tend to feel almost offended if someone's too direct. So something I've learned to do and it's been useful in my own career is, for example, Cindy, if I know you know Adrian Gore, who's very well known in South Africa, mm -hmm. I might say to you, Cindy, I know you know this person. I'm trying to reach this person. What advice or guidance do you have is the best way to reach them? So I find if I ask in that way, I feel comfortable because mm -hmm. I am not comfortable with a direct ask. So that's one thing I find with women. And then the other thing you and I were discussing is salaries. I remember mm -hmm. overhearing an executive one day saying, well, the reason the guys are getting more money than the women is they ask. They negotiate, exactly. exactly. Well, as we say in South Africa, they ask. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say ask. Ask it's and that. ask. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, when it comes to pay equity, men are far more confident and um, comfortable stepping into that space where they really ask what they want for what they want, whereas women tend to be, and I am generalizing, it's not all women, I tend to be a little bit more um, shy or a little bit more reserved in really asking for what they want. And one thing I have learned, um, especially having my own consultancy for the last six years, if you don't ask, you're not going to get, and nobody's going to pay attention um, or even listen. So um, I do believe that um, women and networking, um, we can really do so much more and we can learn from our counterparts in terms of how to network better. But we should also, and I read a beautiful quote, I don't remember the full quote, but the crux of it is, if you are climbing the ladder, don't build a higher ladder, widen your ladder, pull the other woman up. Yes. Um, and it's all to do with um, making space, holding space, holding the door open for the next for the next generation or the next person, the next female to come around. This is how we can build ourselves up as well and be seen and be heard. I love that. Widen the ladder. And yet, how often do you hear women talking about other female leaders and saying it was they were the ones who sabotaged me. So it's so important. And I know Gail Evans wrote a book called She Wins, You Win. You know, mm -hmm. we forget to do this. So, you know, part of our discussion today was to first of all recognize the absolute business sense that empowering women makes. Women being very often the decision makers, mm -hmm. right? Look at how important it is to have representation and we're talking about you know just the business case alone mm -hmm. is so important and if we look at organizations i know mckinsey came up with a, a study not sure how recent it was on companies well companies that were more diverse inclusive 
created an environment for people to succeed were more successful. So we first start with that. But do you agree, Cindy, that it needs to be twofold because we need to help women adopt the mindset of I deserve Absolutely. and then the leaders, HR professionals, management to truly create that environment. So, but, you know, I love the quote, if it's to be, it's up to me. So when you work with, with women in terms of just confidence and saying, I deserve this, just let's talk more about that. Love that. Um, and it is something that um, I do include in my training. I do believe um, that mindfulness practice, um, that healthy mindset, um, really checking in on our own mental health, our self-talk, uh, we tend to talk down on ourselves um, and we, we tend to not be as kind to ourselves as we are to others. I just want to add one thing where you mentioned about uh, women and the buying power. There was a study that was conducted post-COVID and it, I can't remember the exact percentages, but it showed that X percentage of women are the decision makers where they spend their money. So organizations, and I'm, I'm taking a detour, but organizations um, should pay more attention to what women want and listen to what they are saying because they are the ones who ultimately go and do the shopping. Um, again, I'm generalizing quite a lot, but in the households, whether it's online shopping, virtual shopping, uh, or going to a specific um, store, um, you know, if, if there are children, taking care of children, etc. Women make those buying decisions. So I, I, I think it's something that we just have to remind ourselves of. So if you are out there, ask the woman, um, you know, in your in your space, what their thoughts are. What do they and, think of your product or service, for example? So, and I think that's, you know, that's the important part is, yes, we're talking about equity, but we're also talking about business sense and how important that mm -hmm. is. Um, again, how much do you think childhood, part childhood plays in it? Because something I ask the women in my groups is some people like me were raised with, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Although... It's interesting you say this because we've had this discussion in my family. My brothers were sent to private school. My mm -hmm. sister and I were sent to public school, government Thank school you. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So although my sister is a physician and I've gone on, I've never lacked confidence in believing I could do whatever I wanted to do. But just if you had to say to my now late father, um, do you realize that you had gender bias he would probably deny it, but how more obvious, think about this, mm -hmm. sending your boys to private school because they were going to be the breadwinners and they needed the better education, sending mm -hmm. my sister to the government school. I mean, that in itself, and I've thought about that a lot when we talk about gender bias. Yeah unconscious bias something we I was just going to say it's that unconscious bias that exists and there's a, a book um I will find the book reference um and it's all about that the world was designed by men for men we can even go uh, it's actually called the invisible woman and I forget the author right now um, somebody who's watching will find it for us yeah the invisible woman and it's 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 takes it as far as that crash test dummies were designed physically to mimic that of a build of a man. And it's only years later that the likes of Volvo, etc., um, really came to terms with the fact that the crash test dummies were not uh, designed as the woman's physique because they did... Um, uh, they, they gathered information, accident information, wow. and they saw that women were more severely injured in their cars that, sh you know, statistically should not have happened. But then they realized that these crash test dummies were designed to mimic men. So that's just one example. It is fascinating. If you really start digging, it really is fascinating. Um, you know, just that this world was built for men by men. Well, that's also assuming that your driver 
is a man. Is a man. So exactly. that's a, look how that's changed. They now have crash test dunny, dummies that are women. That's exactly. interesting. But getting back to childhood, what I was saying is I see in the groups that I teach, train, as I'm sure do you, for example, Asian culture, and I'm not saying all of Asian culture, but the women tend to be more polite, more demure. I know in South African culture, again, women, because it was historically a very patriarchal society, something we have to work with is allowing women to believe that they have as much say as the men. Mm -hmm. And I do think it starts when you are young. I mean, I have a little girl um, turning eight very soon and my teaching to her, my language that I use to her is you can be whatever you want to be. You, Whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve. Um, I teach her from young to communicate and articulate herself quite clearly, which she does so well, I have to say. She's a feisty little girl and um, she, she really articulates herself and her needs very clearly so I do think that there's for us who are parents who are mothers um, but even the fathers I see that from my husband we promote this respectful culture in our home if I can put it like that where um, you know we we um, we don't discriminate and I always say to my son who is 17 uh, in a few months time that cooking and cleaning is not a gender role. It's a life skill. I love that. Cooking and cleaning. and the, uh, But I think all around, cooking and cleaning is not a gender role. It's a life it's skill. It's a life skill. And teaching, I mean, there's so much in this, right? But what's mm-hmm. interesting, Cindy, is my daughter, my 30-year-old daughter, her and her husband have a one-year-old. Well, he's about 14 months now. But they totally share there is such a difference in the way we were raised and Mm -hmm. such a difference in even my husband when we had children I'm not saying he wasn't involved but this is a whole different level that I see in this generation of Mm -hmm. total shared parenting and you know when you look around New York you see so many fathers with strollers in fact Sometimes, and I remember the last time I was there, more men with strollers more than women. Men. So uh, it's yes. very interesting how, how the shift has taken place. But and still- I think we should celebrate this shift. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we should celebrate this shift because it, it is huge leaps and bounds that we are taking forward um, to creating a more balanced society. Oh, I love that. No, that's that is what we're doing. And I love what you're saying about, you know, you're the mother of an eight year old, because so much does depend on how you were raised. You know, were you one of those children who told, you know, be seen and not heard. Girls must be demure. Girls must smile. Don't offend anybody, you know. And then part of our training is to say, well, you're an adult now. And then, of course, the question I get asked so often in in these sessions, and I'm sure you do too, is, you know, men can be assertive and they're seen as a leader. This is a very Mm -hmm. common one. Men are assertive. Women, when they're assertive, they're seen as aggressive or they get called the B word or, you know, there's so much that takes place. So how do we, you know, how do we shift that? And the most successful women that I see have found a way of navigating both and being authentic. And I think you say the word there, authentic. If we remain our authentic selves and we speak and um, communicate from a place of um, kindness, number one, but still being assertive, et cetera. Excuse me if you hear the birds here. It's uh, the South African birds that are in my outside my uh, office window here. Um, so, yes, we can be assertive, um, but it's, I believe, also the way that we are going to portray ourselves. Um, being assertive doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be aggressive. I do believe that um, we can use conversational technology in such a way that when we speak, we speak from a place of power, but also a place of respect. Um, And in the ontological world, um, I'm an ontological coach as well, and we we talk, we were taught there about the um, 
conversational technologies and the, the roadmap of conversations that we have available to ourselves. And we can start by having a conversation for clarity. And if you think about it in that sense, and you choose your language, yes, it's semantics, but you choose your language carefully, I think we can be so much more impactful and assertive at the same time without having these tags put around our necks as being aggressive or you're trying to be like a man, for example. Um, yeah, so that's what I would share with you about that's that. Excellent. So first of all, just what is an ontological coach? Just explain that to us in a little more detail. Perfect. So an ontological coach looks at the language, emotion, and then the body or the semantics. So, um, and then in the middle is your, in the middle of all those three circles is your way of being. It's your authentic self. It's how you show up in the world. It's what makes you tick. And it's all based on your experiences, your, um, what you've been exposed to, uh, your frame of reference. We all, of course, have a different frame of reference. We were all raised in different uh, places and uh, in a different environment, etc. But there is a golden thread that we look for, and um, we can we say in ontological coaching, um, the way we communicate creates reality. Mm -hmm. It sparks action. That's why I say the language we choose to use while being assertive. Not a problem being assertive, but choose your language in such a way that you still remain respectful and therefore respected. Mm. Cindy, that's a gem. And interestingly enough, I recently worked with a young woman who is in a position, a leadership position. And she says every time she's in a meeting, even though she's the leader, people will address actually to her direct report because he is a man. Mm -hmm. And how... You know, again, without necessarily humiliating the person who says that actually I'm the person, we have worked on ways that she can ensure that people know that she is the person to direct the question. And this to. is a beautiful example of partnering with men in in the organ in the corporate world in the corporate space where we can um, we can lean in um, and you know, have that understanding that if people um, mistaken the, the man for the leader, that he could maybe, you know, um, refer the question to her and, in, you know, maybe introduce her as so-and-so, you know, and this is the position and she would be the one that would, you know, ultimately make the decision. So there's another way that we can learn to communicate with men differently um you know where we can partner have a bit of a partnership with them within an organization um i do think training and development here can definitely play a role where we can have um communication style workshops where we can provide training and development programs that are really tailored to the needs of women employees um you know we can offer in such workshops for example for example, negotiation techniques or um, you know extra communication or different communication techniques. Um, then we've also got to keep in mind that we work and live in a cross-cultural world right now. So uh, you know it's not just you know so that's why things start getting a little tricky, especially in, in the space where I train for you know, for the United Nations. Um, it's a global audience, so. You know, that's why I say I come back to communication. I'm so um, such an advocate for good, clear um, use of language so that we are understood and really actively listening so, so that we can understand where other people are coming from. And sometimes just educate other people. Exactly. You know, be the educator of one of another executive that I've worked with over the years, she's a very diminutive woman and she looks younger than she is. And so often is overlooked and very quickly. And I like how you put it through her language, through her demeanor, establishes her credibility, her wisdom, her expertise. Mm -hmm. 
But getting back to educating people and understanding unconscious bias. So let's just talk about unconscious bias. We are not telling people that it is bad. People have unconscious bias because there is an innate desire to feel safe and to do what is familiar. But it's the ability mm -hmm. to recognize it and override it. Exactly. Yeah. Call, call out the double standard, number one. Call out the unconscious bias that you recognize within yourself. But before you can call it out, you need to have an awareness about yourself and your unconscious bias. And just asking a simple question like, am I being unconsciously biased in this situation? And just to you be know, and that's where the somatic side of the ontological coaching comes in. You know, you can feel it in your body when, you know, you, you maybe get a knot in the stomach, uh, you know, um, you, you, so you could sit up or you could, you know, not breathe deeply and whatever. You, but something in you will trigger physically that, hold on, maybe I am being unconsciously biased here based on my frame of reference. Um, but you know what we can do? Um, and I love using this analogy look up just look up for a moment take a helicopter view and assess yourself assess the language you're using assess how are you are responding or re um, are you responding or reacting you know in a situation or in a conversation for example so when we become so self-aware that we can call out our own unconscious biases i think that's a very powerful place to be in Yes. And in terms of where we are right now, Cindy, and what, again, whoever's just joining us, I'm talking to global learning and development expert. We're talking about this being Women's History Month and empowering the women in our organization and helping the women empower themselves. Something you referred to was the UN. And I know one of your slides that we discussed was UN around different standards and goals for the United Nations. Let's briefly speak about that. And then, unfortunately, our time will be up. So I will make sure that you have all Cindy's contact details should you need to reach her. Thank you, Nadia. And thank you so much for bringing it in. So the United Nations has, and you may or may not know about this uh, for the audience out there, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. These are the SDGs. Now, um, it is a set of goals, 15 different goals, if I have it correct, um, that we that the UN want to achieve by the year 2032. And I hope I have it correct. Um, and I do speak under correction here because I don't have it in front of me right now. However, women's development um, uh, or the, um, yes, women's development is one of the key SDGs, the key sustainable development goals is to create um, a space where there's a level playing field, where we elevate women, where we make space for women, we educate women, um, we mentor them, we have inclusive policies, we're looking at um, our own, you know, diversity and inclusive policies that we have. Um, revise, review your policies, ensure that they are gender inclusive um, and address the unique challenges that women may face in the workplace um, because there are differences. Um, yes, the world is changing, um, but, you know, we still have traditional roles in certain countries, for example, where childcare or child support uh, falls more onto the, the mom's uh, um, shoulders. Um, but, you know, when we look at the SDGs, it's all about us as a collective work together, women and men partnering up to call out double standards, to really embrace the change that needs to happen so that we can reach a point of equilibrium where there's a space for all of us around the table a space for all of us around the table. And Cindy, you know, I always think of the famous phrase, South African phrase, which is Nelson Mandela used so often, Ubuntu, 
We mm-hmm. are human through the humanity of others. And to remember that as exactly. we embrace and embark on creating this equilibrium. That is superb. Cindy Hancock, it has been a pleasure talking to you. If people want to reach you, please tell me how. So a quick search on LinkedIn, look for Cindy Hancock. Uh, You will see a picture that represents myself, number one. Uh, My title is also international trainer. I'm an instructional designer. Um, a digital learning partner. Um, so yes, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find me on floxtraining.design. That is my website. Um, but I'm most responsive on LinkedIn. So please do link and let's continue this conversation. And Flux is P-H-L-O-X. That's correct. Um, Thank you, Cindy. I'm Nadia Vilchik. For more information on streaming or training or speaking, please go on to my website, which is nadiaspeaks.com. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, please also link in with me, link in with Cindy, and let's create a society of equilibrium. This is March. It is Women's History Month. Friday is International Women's Day, and we celebrate women all over the world. 